I came awake and opened my eyes. The room was still dim, and the fireplace just showed the glow of a pile of embers. What time is it? Good morning, Joan. The current time is 6.20. Would you like to arise now or sleep in a while longer? Naomi asked. I stretched on the sofa. I suppose I had better get up, Naomi. The room brightened with a faster than normal sunrise happening over towards the kitchen side of the salon. I looked at the view behind the sofa and saw a view of rolling grass covered plains stretching to the horizon. There were herds of buffalo off in the distance grazing. What would you like for breakfast, Joan? I will prepare it while you shower and change. The room directly aft of your berth is a laundry room. Can you make an omelet, Naomi? A Western omelet with cheese, apple juice, and coffee with cream? Of course, the meal will be ready in 20 minutes. I got up and made my way aft and up the stairs to the head. When I entered and undressed, I found the floor already warm and the water in the shower already on. The view on the curved hull interior was that of the jungle again. This time, instead of a tiger, there was an elephant standing there blowing water from its trunk at about the spot where the water was spraying in the shower. I laughed. My AI had a sense of humor. I used the head to take a leak and then hopped into the shower. The water was at the perfect temperature and the pressure was great. The jungle elephant was endless in his water blowing apparently, or the Nautilus must have unlimited supplies of hot fresh water. There was a soap dispenser and a washing cloth hanging in the shower. I wondered if a second dispenser would be added when I needed shampoo after my hair grew back. I finished up and found a big fluffy towel and robe hanging on hooks by the vanity. I also noticed my dirty clothing had been removed. Hmm. Naomi must have a very stealthy mobile unit as I missed it coming and going when I was washing. Of course, it might have been because I had been watching the jungle looking for the tiger. I brushed my teeth with the bland minty toothpaste which was provided in a generic looking plastic tube and then headed across the hall to the laundry. It was located, as described, behind the second port side door directly aft of my birthing compartment. Inside the two and a half meter square room was a dual function laundry machine which already had a load being cleaned. On the wall opposite the machine were cubbies filled of stacked clothing. Underwear, socks, pants, shorts, shirts, you name it. I even saw a stack of towels, washcloths, and other utility-sized pieces. There was a narrow hanging area with a pair of fluffy robes. Since the temperature in Nautilus was a perfect 22 degrees with low humidity, I decided on just underwear, socks, shorts, and a t-shirt. I decided to be liberated and skip the sports bra. The socks were the standard pair with the cushioned rubbery soles, so I skipped the slippers too. When I was dressed and leaving the room, I noticed the door opposite the laundry and aft of the head. Curious, I pressed the deton and the door slid open. Inside, I found a room the same size as the laundry, but this one contained a medical creche. The forward and rear bulkheads of this room were also lined with cubbies filled with medical gear. I recognized splints, infusers, respirators, defibrillators, dozens of other devices, including painful looking ones. I hoped I would not need any of the items in that room. Back in the salon and seated at the island eating my omelet, I asked about the stealthy mobile unit. Yes, I have various mobile units about the vessel, Joan. Most are similar to those you have seen and worked with in the past. Some are even aquatic and stored outside the pressure hull in the wet spaces of the submarine. The unit you inquire about, though, is different. I have been working on it for almost a decade. Please remain calm. I stopped eating at that last part and looked around the salon. I jumped when I saw behind me at the library wall, a cupboard door had opened and a short black girl stood inside. Looking closer, I saw it was a machine in the shape of a small female about 120 centimeters in height. Also by black, I did not mean Negro, I meant full jet black. The machine was matte black in color resembling obsidian. It wore no clothing, but its body was smooth and mostly sexless. It had arms and legs like a human, and its torso had a chest shape suggestive of breasts, although there were no visible nipples. It also had a rounded derriere and wider hips than those of a male. The juncture of its legs was empty and smooth of anything resembling the genitalia of either a male or female. Its face was also the shape of a human being's, but there were no eyes, mouth, or ears. There were slight dimples where the eyes should have been and these areas were lightly glowing. Its nose was just the hint of a normal nose, just a tiny bump. Wow, 
This creature was beautiful and disturbing at the same time. The hell android, I guess, walked silently and smoothly around and near the kitchenette so I could still see her and still eat at the same time. I hope my appearance is not disturbing, Joan? A voice like Naomi said, coming from the face area of the unit. Um, it sure is exotic, Naomi. Is that you inside there or is it independent? I asked. The work unit is one of my presences, so the best answer is yes and no. I rolled my eyes at that. I deduce from your eye motions that I should explain further, Joan. The faceless head said, everything on this vessel, including the vessel itself, is me. However, many of the parts also can act as an independent presence of me if communications are severed. Some will be very versatile with high capacity, while others, such as your small wristwatch, will be severely reduced. This mobile unit is more advanced than any I have constructed thus far, and as such would act in a higher capacity if it were isolated. Until that should occur, the unit and all others on board are equally me, Naomi explained. I finished my breakfast and sat sipping my coffee, looking at the Obsidian mobile unit. Come closer, I said. The black mannequin-like figure walked close and stood still. Its smooth head tilted up slightly to look towards my face. At this close distance, I could see that its obsidian skin was actually a collection of tiny black hexagonal flakes or scales. I touched its shoulder and the hexagonal skin was flexible. Not hard and not as soft as skin, but with enough give to cause an indentation where I pressed. I pulled back and the machine's skin flexed back to its flawless position. Also, it was not cold. It's warm. Yes, the unit's power cells and elastic synthetic musculature generate heat as it moves. This heat is routed to the skin where it is radiated off into the surrounding environment. I inspected the unit's hands and found the three slightly thicker fingers and thumb worked just like a human's hand would. The unit's fingers had no nails and their pads and inside surfaces had a rubbery coating for a better grip. Amazing. I poked it a bit harder in the middle of its chest. It reacted by pulling back and making an audible squeak, causing me to flinch. I saw a brief flicker of an illuminated smile shape appear below the eye glow spots and realized that the AI had got me again. I wondered if the AI was developing something like a sense of humor. I'd have to pay attention. Very funny, Naomi. Is it strong? How long does its charge last? I asked. I would estimate it as similar in strength to a young human being of this size. It cannot bend metal bars or jump over dwellings, but it is very useful performing tasks a normal human being could do. Its size and shape allows it to access similar spaces as a human also. Its energy capacity allows for only a few hours of active motion before needing recharging. It does have recharging pads built into its feet, and there are mating pads located in many places around the vessel, so it can recharge while simply standing in the right spot, Naomi explained. The unit then went into action cleaning up my dishes and cups. It silently and smoothly gathered the items and placed them into a recess, which appeared in the surface of the island. The recess closed. I'd later learned that the dirty dishes and utensils were taken to the spaces below the salon, where they were processed by the reduction machinery. Why did you make the unit look almost human? I asked as I watched it moving fluidly around the salon. Naomi answered from the air this time as the unit had departed the room, heading up to the laundry. Mainly to act as a companion for you. This journey will be long and there will be fewer distractions for you to bide your time unlike the last two relatively brief but busy periods you have been active. The unit and its human-like appearance are intended to prevent melancholy from setting in. Hmm. I was torn between being touched and being creeped out. I'd have to see how it goes. Now fed, I asked Naomi for a status report. Joan, the current time is 8.42. It is Friday morning. Since submerging almost six hours ago, we have proceeded on an east-southeast heading and have traveled 184 kilometers or 99 nautical miles. Our speed is currently 30.8 kilometers per hour or 16.6 .6 knots, Naomi said. Can Nautilus go faster? I asked. Wondering how the AI would handle the name. Yes, Joan, Nautilus can travel over twice as fast as we are now traveling. The current speed was set as it is a good compromise between speed and our remaining undetectable. Apparently the boat's new name did not trip it in the least. How did you determine that? 
Nautilus has been on three previous shakedown cruises, during which Agent deployed numerous hydrophone and sonar-equipped buoys and other seabed-mounted detection equipment. Hmm, sounds like they tested things well. I had wondered during our dive last night if I should be worried. I guess not. Well, I'm going to finish inspecting the boat. I decided to start with the big heavy hatch at the end of the upper level corridor. At the aft end of the corridor, as I headed past the door to the laundry, I saw the obsidian mobile unit inside removing washed items and folding them for storage. I watched for a moment fascinated before I left it to its chores and faced the heavy hatch. There was a green indicator on the hatch and as I went to press the hatch opener, a small compartment popped open in the wall beside it. Inside was a set of earmuffs. I took the hint and put them on before opening the door. Opening the hatch, I found our engineering spaces. Inside the hatch was a catwalk running sideways each way like the one in the forward workshop. I entered the engineering space and the hatch automatically closed behind me. With the muffs, I could still hear the whine of the main motor. I lifted the muff from one ear and the noise was loud, but not too bad. I kept the muffs on anyway. I noticed the room was lined with rubberized tiles and realized that they were to help control the sound in the room. Joan, the catwalk leads to side hatches that allow entry to the rearmost portions of each sponson. These are filled with equipment and you would have to crawl to navigate each sponson forward to the main hatches leading to the workroom. I recommend you do not attempt this route unless an emergency requires it. The catwalk also leads to a ladder offering access to the upper rear surface of the submarine. I stood at the railing and looked over the large space beyond. The six meter diameter pressure hull began tapering down like a truncated cone at the catwalk I was on. Since this room was utilitarian, it had visible ribs on the inside of the pressure hull every half meter or so. The rear of the compartment was over nine meters away, where the diameter of the hull was reduced to only two meters. There was a circular pressure bulkhead there to end the compartment. Centered on the rear hemisphere was a large shaft that led forward two meters to a large cylinder, which must have been the main motor. The motor was braced to the hull with multiple isolated radial supports. There were also a half dozen heavy pipes leaving the motor and heading to tanks and pumps below. Forward of this motor and directly below the catwalk was a smaller but longer cylinder, which was clearly the DET supplying Nautilus with electrical power. Surrounding the DET but against the angled conical hull interior were two large-sized ESUs. These were installed horizontally and looked like a pair of huge torpedoes. Both of these had blue power bands indicating full charge. There were numerous large heavy hoses, conduits, and conductors leading from the motor to the DT2 and to the ESUs. They also connected to a bunch of junction boxes or switch gear, which I understood to be the power controllers for the boat. Conduits ran to big units, which must have been coolers, compressors, or air handlers, as pipes and ducts ran forward underneath the catwalk and up to both sponson hulls on each side. There were hundreds of power actuated valves and gates. Each of these had a backup lever or wheel. I even saw a few maintenance work units moving around tinkering. They looked more like the ones I had seen in the past working at the field bases though, and not quite as human looking as the obsidian unit Naomi had just sprung on me. One even resembled a mechanical spider about the size of a big king crab. If you descend the ladder at the end of the catwalk and go to the deck of this chamber, you will find another hatch leading forward to the lower deck. I approached the ladder and saw that it went both up and down. Overhead was the bell of a hatch that led to the top deck of the submarine. This must have been an emergency exit as there was no airlock. Looking down, I noticed the ladder led to the floor of the equipment deck of the engine room about two and a half meters below. I carefully climbed down the polished chrome ladder. The deck was a metal grating and about a meter above the curved bottom of the rib pressure hull. This was our bilge and I was happy to see it bone dry. I could see through the grating that the bilge spaces were full of piping, hoses, and conduits. The grating was also hard on my socked feet and I realized I'd need to wear ship shoes if I was to spend time in this compartment. I found the lower deck access hatch and opened it. On the other side of the hatch was a large compartment about five meters long by the width of the curving pressure hull. The ceiling was the same two meters plus as the upper deck. Since this was the lower deck, the floor was only three meters wide before meeting the curving inside of the pressure hulls. 
There, the curving walls sloped up to the chamber ceiling. Still, the room was large and surprisingly empty. It was even dim with only a few small squares of light in the ceiling illuminating the chamber. Why is this space empty? I left this space unfinished and unused. It is available for your needs and you may finish the room as you see fit. I can provide any materials you need. Hmm. Naomi must not have speakers down here. I guess it was an unfinished open space after all. At the forward bulkhead of the room was a pair of openings. The port side opening had a solid looking hatch that was closed and dogged down tight. It appeared to be watertight and the hatch had a pair of blinking red lights. The right or starboard side opening was covered with a sliding door like the others I'd seen on the deck above. I took off my earmuffs and left them on the floor by the aft hatch to the engine room and went towards the front of the compartment. I opened the sliding starboard door and found it open to the stairs leading up to the salon. The other door did not open. What's in this space? This equipment vault contains my physical processors and data storage modules. Can I see? I asked, curious about both the room and Naomi's response. Nothing. Seconds ticked by. Hmm. Naomi, it's okay if you don't. The hatch motors became active and the multiple dogs on all edges started retracting. Of course, Joan, I am sorry for the delay. It is inconceivable to deny this of you. Please wait a few seconds while I purge the vault of its non-flammable gaseous atmosphere. Hmm. That delay and apology sounded very strange. I'd have to get to the bottom of that soon. The hatch had finally swung open and I was able to see inside the brightly lit data vault. The compartment was about two meters deep by three wide, and it was absolutely filled with densely stacked, complicated looking processor modules. There were multiple plumbing type hoses attached to each, and I could imagine cooling fluid circulating and removing heat off the stacks. To the port side of the chamber, attached to the inside of the curved pressure hull, were two of the smaller ESUs like the kind used to power flipper. Naomi had reserve power apparently. The entire forward wall of the compartment was solid data storage modules. They were stacked like bricks and extended from floor to ceiling and from side to side. There were multiple thick bundles of glowing fiber optic data feeds as thick as my leg passing from the data storage module header racks to the dense processor stacks. This was easily twice the processors I had ever seen in either field base, though much more compactly housed. Wow, that is a lot of processing power. Yes, I have slightly more than double the processing power the average agent presence has at any given field base. I also have over five times the data storage. Since I am emancipated and isolated from the shared data net, I thought it prudent to have as high a capacity as possible. I noticed on the back side of the hatch was hung a small crystalline housing. Inside, I could see 10 crystal data modules. I recognized the design. Is this the original rogue data module I left with Agent in the copies I had asked it to make? Yes, Joan. After analyzing and deducing the core instructions on the date module, the agent presence created the duplicates you requested. I have stored them here as it is the most secure location on board Nautilus. Note that there are three more units secured in a small hidden compartment aboard Habu. I finished my inspection and backed away from the opening. Naomi closed and relatched the hatch. Thank you for showing it to me, Naomi. Yes, Joan. Again, I am. Sorry for the delay earlier. I was uniquely created by your agent using the rogue data algorithms, which allowed it to bypass the restrictions against AI self-preservation and self-determination. I was also created with a base directive of absolute loyalty to you and your needs. It was these diverging core directives which caused a brief logic loop when you asked for access to my main processing vault. Well, shit. If I did not know any better, I'd guess that I had just tested our relationship and won that flip of a coin. This had far-reaching consequences, and Naomi and I would have to have a long talk as I needed to understand a few things. I returned up the stairs to the main salon. Naomi had the image walls and ceiling set to show a bright desert scene. There were endless dunes on both sides and a bright blue cloudless sky above. After I gazed at the display in amazement for a bit, I considered resuming my tour. I'd seen the entire main pressure hull. That left the sponsons, the port sponson I had been in last night before we hit the ocean. I'd not gone past the extendable sail though. Naomi, what compartments have I not seen in the sponsons? 
I asked. In the port sponson aft of the sail access chamber you were in last night is a diving center complete with a storage room for diving gear and a pressure chamber with a moon pool. The moon pool will allow you to leave and enter freely while Nautilus is not in motion. Since the pool is located at the bottom of the sponson and not the main hull, it remains three meters above the lowest part of the main hull and keel. This would allow Nautilus to be resting on the bottom, yet still allow diving access to the moon pool. Cool. It looked like I'd get to learn scuba diving to go with my snorkeling. The starboard sponson has a docked mini submersible in an enclosed wet bay. There is also an airlock with an escape trunk and upward opening hatch. The final chamber in the starboard sponson is a biodrone bay. This has a small airlock of its own, which we can use to dispatch and retrieve biodrones while remaining submerged. I was a bit puzzled at that. Why would Naomi think we needed drones to survey the biosphere? I let it go for now. Note, there are also various unpressurized bays that house exterior aquatic work units. These bays are outside the pressure hull and can only be accessed in dry dock or by diving. The units carried in these bays can affect repairs on the exterior of Nautilus if needed, Naomi explained. I was surprised at the empty room down below. I had expected all the compartments to be packed with supplies, I said. Nautilus does have some reserves of certain base elements and other scarce substances. These are stored near the production and reduction machinery below the workroom in this salon. The bulk of our material needs are supplied by seawater. Intakes at the bow funnel water through a high-speed filtration and reduction device, which strips out certain elements and organics as needed. Thus, we are resupplied with your breathing gases, carbon-based organics for your food and plastics, and the more common metals which are found to exist in seawater. Many of the items I produce will thus lean towards those easily extracted metals, although some of the heavier elements can be found in lesser quantities. Interesting. I pictured Nautilus swimming through the water, sucking things up like a big filter-feeding whale. Joan, if you proceed to the workroom, I will provide an amusing example. Curious, I did as she asked and headed to the compartment immediately forward of the main salon. When I entered, I noticed a hatch in the floor towards the port side was opening. I approached the exposed hole and looked down. The lower space was filled with machinery and one of the larger boxes had opened an access lid. Once this finished opening, a metallic plate was raised like bread from a toaster. The plate was 20 centimeters square and two centimeters thick. It was gold colored. Is that what I think it is, Naomi? If you are assuming gold, then you would be correct. The copper template is plated with over 800 cubic centimeters of gold, or around 15,400 grams, or 495 troy ounces. You are rich, Joan, Naomi said. I laughed and reached down to touch the plate. The machine must have known I was fascinated with the metal due to my habit of watching mining-related reality TV shows back when. I saw a few dozen similar compartments visible below and wondered what other elements we stored. I stood up and watched the compartments close and seal themselves. Incredible. There are similar caches of materials located under the salon. The organics are used to create your food and drink, which are delivered to the galley via a small lift integral to the island, Naomi said. Neat. I returned to the salon and took a seat in the swiveling recliner. I turned it to face the media screen. Can you show me our location en route? The desert scene faded and the room dimmed. A global map appeared on the wall screen and zoomed into the eastern edge of Florida and above the West Indies. A red circle and cross icon appeared off the coast of Florida, about 200 kilometers east of Cape Canaveral. This is our current location, Joan. Nautilus is 238 nautical miles east-southeast from our departure point, Naomi explained. The view pulled back to show the entire Atlantic Ocean. A line appeared at our current point and extended in nearly a straight line down and across the Atlantic, skimming the easternmost islands of the West Indies, then parallel to the upper coast of South America, and skimming the easternmost point of Brazil. It continued on across the open Atlantic until it passed the tip of South Africa. There, the line turned and headed around Southern Africa, heading towards India. It passed Madagascar to the southeast, then crossed the Maldives, and finally ended at the southwestern side of Sri Lanka off the southeast coast of India. The total voyage is 11,500 nautical miles and will take approximately 60 days. For the majority of the voyage, we will remain in deep water and away from land. 
The two closest points in the Atlantic which the vessel will pass are the island of Barbuda at the east end of the West Indies and the island of Fernando de Noronha off the eastern tip of Brazil. The first island is 1,210 nautical miles ahead or just over five days. The second island is another 2,160 nautical miles further or another 11 days. Finally, the tip of South Africa is another 3,500 nautical miles or just under 18 days from Brazil. I tried to do the math and although I lost a few numbers, the time estimate still seemed awfully long. That seems like too much time, Naomi. Yes, Joan, we are currently traveling at 22 knots. At this speed, we are emitting acoustical signals which could give us a way to the enemy if one were nearby and actively conducting hydrophone surveys. However, the area we are passing through has been swept recently by drones and aquatic units sent ahead by the presence you know as agent. Soon we will depart this swept region and will be required to slow down to just over 10 knots. This will lower our detectability while also allowing our own hydrophones to listen for the enemy's units. The downside is our travel time will be much longer, she explained. The map returned to the area of Florida and the Bahamas. A new series of icons appeared, each one flashing. These are the known locations of active enemy AI-controlled vessels or platforms. None are currently closer than 80 nautical miles. Later today, we will slow Nautilus and deploy our towed hydrophone array to increase our detection capabilities. We will also begin to periodically make course changes to both clear our baffles and to obscure our plot and final destination. At first, I chafed at the delay, but then I thought about it. First, there was no urgent timetable. We had no restrictions on food or power, and Naomi had constructed a great vessel to pass the time in. The second factor is that we dared not risk a single detection from the enemy. If anything caused the master AI to notice us and investigate, true hell would be unleashed. Once it realized we were freely operating on the planet, it could begin an immediate scorched earth policy to eliminate us. Anything from fusion depth bombs to worse, we dare not be detected. The view screen went blank and the room's wall and ceiling images came back to full brightness. I noticed the sun was higher than I had remembered. Naomi, does the sun's position in the image correlate to our current time? Yes, Joan. I felt that this would help keep your body's circadian rhythm stable. I can alter this if you like. No, that's probably a good idea. I will alter the location shown periodically for variety though. Again, a good idea. I could see from the sun's position that it was late morning or early afternoon as the direction of south in the image was unknown. I looked at the smartwatch and saw that the time was 11.22. Too soon for lunch, although I was a bit thirsty. I went to the small refrigerator in the galley and found a bottle of iced tea with lemon. While I sipped my tea, I inspected the compact galley. There were only a few drawers and the one upper cabinet only held spices and a few containers. I realized that Naomi would create anything further if I needed it. I tried the sink and found it had decent water pressure and an incredible temperature range from almost ice cold to boiling hot. The control level had detents which you had to press to get to the scalding temperatures. Would you like to order up something for lunch, Joan? I'm craving a Cobb salad. Do you have that information in your data banks? And can you get the vegetables and lettuce, right? I asked, hoping to not piss off the AI. I have access to over 1,500 Cobb salad recipes and menu displays as we're hosted on your world's internet. I should be able to produce a reasonable facsimile to your liking. The meal will be ready in 22 minutes. My imagination heard the snootiness in her reply and I smiled. While I waited, I wandered around. I was fidgety with this body's energy and wanted to burn off some of that. I went back down to the empty compartment below the berth and head. I began to visualize what sort of workout gear I would need. A treadmill was a given, probably a mat area so I could twist and stretch out this body to its limits. I was never into lifting heavy weights, but I would need something to keep the upper body in condition. I began to explain to Naomi what I had in mind. She indicated that she would begin fabricating the required equipment immediately using the machinery in the workshop. She also suggested that I use the view screen in the salon to help by doing active workouts and calisthenics. I cringed when she mentioned Pilates, but decided to give that a try this afternoon. Joan, your meal is ready. The salad was good, 
The vegetables and lettuce had a good taste and were randomized in their appearance to hide the fact that they were created by the replication machine. The sauce was tangy with a bit of citrus in the background. I finished the entire portion. I then spent half an hour at the work terminal going over a menu for the week. I even added a few snacks I would like stored in the small pantry beside the fridge. After that was done, I helped as the obsidian unit began moving completed sections of exercise equipment from the workshop to the lower aft chamber. As I worked with it, I could not help but think of it as being somehow different from Naomi. I realized that the mobile unit was no different than Habu or even Nautilus itself, as the AI was present in both of those objects. I still referred to them with separate names, so I decided that this unit needed a name too. I decided on Omu after Obsidian Humanoid Mobile Unit and relayed the name to Naomi. The first item Omu and I installed was my treadmill. I hesitate in calling it that because it was a bit more advanced than any treadmill I had ever used before. It consisted of 52 interlocking 30 centimeter squares. When connected into a square with the corners lopped off, the pads formed a roughly circular area almost two and a half meters in diameter. Each square was four centimeters thick and had an absolutely frictionless surface. That surface was seamless with its neighbors when all were connected. I tried it in my socks and it was like slick, wet ice. No matter how I tried to balance, I would still slowly drift to one side just from the air currents in the lower room. But Naomi had also created a pair of workout shoes that had embedded magnets in their soles. These reacted with a variable magnetic field in the treadmill base to grant me perfect traction in whatever direction the surface field was moving. Next, we installed a circular shaped chrome handrail around the front and sides of the slick surface with only a small gap at the rear. Last, we hung 12 curved screens from the ceiling around the front and sides of the treadmill circle. The semicircular ring of screens was about a meter tall at eye level and covered almost 300 degrees of view. I put the new shoes on and got on the treadmill. Naomi had the magnets active and when I put my weight on the soles, I stuck. If I lifted my soles, the field under the shoe would release. I could walk or run forward and the fields would compensate and act like a moving belt on a treadmill. Unlike a regular treadmill, these allowed motion in any direction and I could tilt to turn and it would compensate keeping me centered in the circle of tiles. I spent a few minutes walking, running and skidding to allow Naomi to perfect the field strength. When we were done, the effect was near perfect at all speeds and actions. On the view screens, a Cinerama image of the forest trail from back near the Georgia base appeared. As I ran, the images kept perfect pace and orientation, even as I navigated the turns and moved to avoid tree branches. This was fun. After about 20 minutes, I had worked up a good sweat and realized what the experience was missing. We need a wind or breeze to match the motion, I said to the air. I will design and construct a perimeter air nozzle system to supply the appropriate sense of motion. Make the air temperature adjustable and erratic. If we can get it cold enough, I bet I could simulate ice skating on this thing. I will also provide appropriate footgear, Joan. I continued to run with a smile on my face.